Namaste. I'm Reverend Wendy Craig Purcell here at the Unity Center in beautiful San Diego. You know, we are always searching for ways to live the example of our teachings in order to improve our world. One of the ways we accomplish this is with Partners Fair Trade Boutique, our store here at the Unity Center campus. You'll find many unique items from around the world, all ethically sourced through fair trade. You know, I don't know why. I, I, I have read so many books, and I listened to so many books, and I've been in this teaching for a long, long time. But this little book, The Power of Receiving by Amanda Owen, escaped me until just very, very recently. And maybe it's because I wasn't ready to receive it. The whole, the whole idea of the power of receiving is, in a way, fresh and unique to me. I talked about that a little bit last, last Sunday. You know, most of us are grown up to, are, are taught it's better to give than to receive. If we've grown up in a church environment, we've probably heard the scripture verse, God loves a cheerful giver. And while giving is certainly important, we don't usually talk about and emphasize that it's part of the cycle to receive. That if we're only giving, 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 we will soon be what? Exhausted and empty. And if everybody's here just to be givers, then who is there to receive, right? And so this idea of recognizing that there is a need for this balance and to actually practice, and that's the part I think is a beautiful, unique idea to me, to actually practice being a good receiver. You know, we think about and we say things like, oh, that person's just a really good giver. They're really, really generous. But when was the last time you heard somebody say, that person's a really good receiver? We, we kind of just don't go there, right? So I think there's a little bit of cleaning up work and healing work that we might need to do. Today we're going to take a look at the idea of the consciousness of a receiver, what is the consciousness of a receiver, and the suggested three steps that Amanda writes about in the book for actually becoming a better receiver. So first the idea of the consciousness of a receiver. In metaphysics, we focus a lot, in our spiritual practice, we focus a lot on consciousness. What is consciousness? It's the conglomerate of our thinking, our feeling, our emotions, our attitudes, our actions, our, our decisions, our behaviors. It is the causative and formative force in our lives. And so the consciousness of a receiver is a very specific consciousness. In her book, she writes about states of consciousness and suggests that there are two kind of categories, and I'd never quite looked at them this way. She identifies the two categories of consciousness as either the receptive or receiving category of consciousness or the active or giving category or state of consciousness. So either a receptive state of consciousness or an active state of consciousness. Stay with that for just a moment. When you think about consciousness and states of consciousness, what comes to mind? And as you think about various states of consciousness, I'm going to go read through a list for you. As you think about it, where do they kind of fall? I think she's onto something here that most, if not all, fall, generally speaking, under what we might call the receptive state of consciousness or the active state of consciousness. And remember, in reality, we're not saying one is better than the other. We're not saying that at all. We're saying they're both and, both and. So here are some suggestions and um, list of receptive states and then what you might look at as the active state. So as I read these to you, and the first in each pair is going to be the receptive state, take that in, 
And then as you hear the active state, just kind of notice if you tend to lean in one place more than the other, okay? Meditating, analyzing, listening, talking, accepting, investigating, allowing, controlling, opening, influencing, relaxing, Promoting, letting go, multitasking, noticing, persuading, being thankful, taking for granted, observing, defining, welcoming, judging, Yielding, exploring, embracing, pushing. She suggests many more states. The value in kind of taking that in is just to notice, as you listened, would you say you were in balance? Or would you say, "Mm, you know what, I think I live more in the active state, in the giving state, or, no, I think I'm doing pretty good in this balance here. So again, it's not about giving is always better, receiving is always less than. It's the balance that we're trying to achieve. And I think we do need to take a look at the culture that we grow up in and through that does seem to be skewed much more talking about and praising the experience and the action of giving than really teaching and helping us to feel comfortable with the act of receiving, not taking. We'll get into that even more next week. We touched upon it a little bit last week. There's a difference between taking, right? When we think of taking and it's kind of this energy of grabbing and it usually comes comes from a place of fear, of, of lack, of I better get it because it might go away. But receiving is accepting. Receiving is the energy of welcoming. Think about when you have been given a, a physical gift or been paid a, paid a compliment, and you actually were able to take that in and to receive it, right? You didn't take it, even though I just used the word take. You received it, you welcomed it. That's a different feeling, right? That's the concept that I think she's trying to write about in the book and that I'm finding myself just very, very drawn to. Because in our metaphysics, we talk so much about giving, we also need to talk about receiving. And so the idea is to become more skillful and more gracious in the ability to receive. And for some of us, what that also means is dealing with feelings of not being worthy, right? Well, I'm not worthy of that. If the giver, whether it's a person or a life, is giving to you, inherent in that act is the very equality of you being worthy of receiving whatever that is. That's reciprocity. That's reciprocity. So as you think about these states of giving and receiving, think about an area of your life where maybe you would benefit from practicing learning to be a better receiver. And maybe that area of your life is in your primary relationships. Maybe you give, give, give in your relationships and you don't receive. You don't leave time and space for yourself to receive what another gives. Or maybe it might be in your business um, part of your life, your work part of your life. But think of an area of your life where you kind of sense, hmm, I might do better if I could receive here more, if I could get more comfortable, if I could feel more worthy, if I could accept what life is trying to give to me. There's a scripture verse, it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Those are beautiful, inspiring words. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. 
But again, to experience the kingdom, we have to receive it. We have to complete the cycle, right? We have to complete the cycle. Ernest Holmes in The Science of Mind put it this way, it is God's pleasure to give us the kingdom. If it is God's pleasure to give us the kingdom, then it should be our privilege to accept the gift. All things are given unto us. The gift of heaven is forever made, but we shall have to do the taking. So where in your life, when I said to you, think about an area, you know, maybe your primary relationships, your personal relationships, or your career, where you need to practice the, the states of receiving better. Is it about learning to listen better? Is it about welcoming? Is it about less pushing? What would that look like for you? Can you take that in? Can you think about that? What would that look like? And more than that, what would it feel like? What would it feel like? Can you open yourself to that? Receiving requires openness, does it not? Can you put something in my hands if they're closed? No. If the cup is turned upside down, can it receive? No, it needs to be lifted up. Our hands need to be open. And so for us, it's that practice. And one of the best ways to practice is to notice when we're not doing it. To back into it that way, to notice when we're not doing it. This is why in the three steps, she begins with, of the three steps to developing more of a consciousness of a receiver, is we've got to get better at accepting something as simple as a compliment. To really notice how we are when somebody pays us a compliment. Can we simply say, thank you? Or do we undermine it with, you know, somebody compliments something we're wearing. Oh, this old thing. Or somebody compliments something we've just done for them, a favor. Oh, no big deal. Right? We just, it's like throwing the compliment back in their face. Did any of you practice any of this last week? Even just noticing if somebody is paying you a compliment, how you receive it? Not your head if you did. I imagine that just the willingness to practice it brought some insights into yourself. Jimmer, I'm reminded of something I think that you shared with me a, a number of weeks ago. We were talking about accepting compliments, really, and I forget exactly how you worded it, but what it's, what's um, stuck with me is you said something like this. When somebody has paid me a compliment, like I've done a really good job singing something, and I don't necessarily feel like I have, that you said to me, my coach taught me to say, I'm glad you think so, thank you. And that stuck with it. It's like, okay, so somebody pays me a compliment, somebody pays you a compliment, and your practice from the way you've always been is like, oh, no, 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 or to just push it away to maybe be able to take it in by simply saying, I'm really glad you think so, thank you. Doesn't that feel different? Then undermining it, right? Do you remember that conversation? You know, it stuck with me, it stuck with me. So, you know, we're talking about graciously receiving, whether it's a compliment or a favor or a gift or something, to just graciously receive it. The universe responds to how receptive we are. And you know, when, in order for a giver to really be able to give and feel good about what they've given, the receiver needs to do their part. I didn't experience just, this is Sunday, right? Yes, this is Sunday. Just yes, I should know this is Sunday. So on Friday, we had the paramedics come to my house once again. Sorry, Mom. We had the paramedics come to my house once again. There was a false, false alarm. And so the paramedics and the fire department was there, and everything was all fine. But it's about the fifth or sixth time that this has happened in probably the last six months or so. And so I had this overwhelming need to give. And I needed my giving to really be received so I could feel like I really gave. So yesterday I swung by the fire department that's only two miles from my house. We're almost on a first name basis. They say, yes, we know your driveway. Got to drive up it. You're at 177 and they finish the numbers of the, my house. And 
I just had to express my gratitude to them. But if they had not been so gracious in receiving, I would have felt like I was giving something and it fell flat. But they received it with the same degree of joy that I had in being able to say thank you. Does that make sense what we're talking about here? That's the reciprocity. That's very different than grabbing and taking from a place of fear or lack, but just welcoming somebody else's gesture of goodwill or thanks. And if it takes some practice for us, well, then we have to practice it. And if it means that at first we're going to feel uncomfortable because we feel like, well, maybe I don't deserve it, can we reframe that and simply say, but maybe the universe is trying to help me understand that I do. Why is it coming into my life otherwise? And can I say thank you? Can I welcome it in if only so the giver feels good? Does that make sense? Okay. So... She spends quite a bit of time in saying that the learning how to accept compliments is really important. The second, and I, I'll mention it, I'm not going to dwell on it, but the second is a practice that you're all familiar with. And it's a practice of counting our blessings, of really being deliberate about that as a practice, of setting a little bit of time every single day to be thinking about and counting, articulating, naming some of our blessings. A great practice, if you really want to deepen your and strengthen your receiving muscles, would be for the next 40 days, there's kind of some beautiful symbology with, with 40 in our scriptures, for the next 40 days, spend some time every single day writing down, not just thinking about, writing down five things you're grateful for. You don't have to write a book, but just five things, five things that you're grateful for every single day for the next 40 days. Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness. The Israelites wandered through the desert and the wilderness for 40 years. It was 40, 40 days before David stepped forward after the taunting of Goliath. Is the number 40 magical? Not really. But the idea of 40 as it's contained in both the Old Testament and the New Testament is it's the idea of completion, of really getting something, really anchoring it in. And if you really want to put the practice on steroids, not just for 40 days and not just five things, but of those five things, pick one and hold that one thing in your mind and in your heart for 60 seconds. Every one of us has 60 seconds. Hold it in your mind and heart. Really feel it. Really think about it. And then the third, and I like how she words this because the words will grab your attention. So she says the first has to do with getting comfortable and good at receiving compliments. The second step to really getting better at being a good receiver is to make Gratitude, counting your blessings of practice. And a third, she says, is getting spiritually naked. Spiritually naked. What does that mean? Spiritually naked. It means to be authentic. It means to bring your whole self into your relationships. Your whole self into your exchanges, your dialogue. I was taken by a couple of examples, and I want to share just a few of them with you very quickly in, in the book. To be spiritually naked is to be self-revealing. So oftentimes we, are, we get messages from growing up and from the world we live in that we need to have our act together, that it's a sign of weakness to express that you may be struggling or you need help. And so many times we don't show up in our full authenticity about what's really going on in our lives. And when we do that, we are excluding the other as well as the universe from being able to help us. We're keeping ourselves away from receiving the very thing that we might need because of our fear 
of being fully seen or being fully known. And so here are some examples that, that she gives. She says, when we do not reveal what we're experiencing in our life, when we do not reveal what we're experiencing, we don't give others a chance to be there for us or to give to us. And what so often happens is that the people in your life do not consider what you may be experiencing or feeling. And then she gives some very simple examples. See if you don't find yourself in some of these examples. So a friend says to you, how are you making out with your job search? The old you, the one who's not learning how to receive yet, the old you says, great. The friend concludes, gee, she seems to be doing just fine. I was just thinking of a company that would be a great fit for her, but I don't want to intrude on what seems to be working. She obviously has it handled. Daughter, mom, some friends invited me to go out tonight. Will you watch the kids? Old you, sure. What time do you need me there? Daughter concludes, I'm glad mom is always so available and obviously enjoys spending all her free time with my children. I was thinking of searching for a babysitter, but why should I bother when mom loves watching the kids so much? This is a perfect situation. We're both getting our needs met. I'll share just one more. Acquaintance says, you're so independent. Do you prefer being single? Old you. I don't need anyone to complete me. I'm very satisfied with my life. Acquaintance concludes, I know someone who I think would really like her, but he's looking for a serious relationship, so I'm not going to mention it. She seems very content. Get the picture? I've, I've really related to those, the, the concept that she was teaching here, that if we're not spiritually naked, so we're not spiritually naked when we're not being truthful, right? When we're trying to just put our very best out there, especially with the very people who probably love us and really care about us, right? And who want to help. But if they don't see where it is that we might need some help, where they might give so we can receive, then they just form a conclusion that probably isn't an accurate conclusion. So to be spiritually naked is to be self-revealing. It's to trust others enough to let them in, to allow yourself to be seen, and in being seen, to allow yourself to receive. So I hope you've enjoyed kind of listening in and exploring some of her ideas and some of the things that I've shared with you, and that you'll take this and, and make it your own. Make it your own. Just keep your radar, your mind aware as you go throughout just your, your normal life. When life is trying to give you something, whatever it is, how are you receiving it? Are you receiving it? And is there any room for improvement? God bless you. Namaste. Namaste.